everybody. Good afternoon for those of us in Europe or somewhere else in the world. This is another Monday with the Wizards of Ox, and we're really happy to talk to you today. There's uh, four wizards. So there's Monique and Carla and Susan and I'm Patricia de la Garza. So hello, everybody. And today we're going to be talking uh, on a subject that I think you're going to find very interesting. And we're going to be talking briefly about dumping. And then we're going to be talking about some of the things we see when we have physiological changes. And uh, I think that's going to be uh, useful, not only in your oxalate journey, but everywhere you go. <laughs> so let's just, get, um, let's just get started. We're going to ask everybody if they could please close their mics so that we don't have any, you know, any background noises and let's get started. So we had uh, to give you a little bit of an idea. We started talking about what was going to be the topic for today's discussion. And we were talking about how many questions there are about dumping. And dumping can be a number of things. And some of the things are really particular to a person. And that might cause is like, why is Oxalate doing this to me? And, uh, and that's also because of inflammation and the previous injuries that you might have had or previous places where you are sensitive or sensible or have had some sort of you know scar tissue or things like that settling up and then the oxalate is going to tend to accumulate there um, as a very simple example when I started realizing that you know oxalate could be guilty for things that might not be in the general population was when I started having pain on my right arch on my foot and I was like how many people get arch pain on the right foot only well um I could tell you immediately that I knew that was just me because I had a ballet injury on that foot at that place where my point shoe broke and I just went with it and um, so many things that you're saying, it's not possible that oxalate is guilty of everything that I read on the group. Well, actually it is <laughs> because it's, it's taken in consideration your history and the reaction that oxalate has to it. So I don't know if somebody else wants to, um, I don't know, I'm just setting the, the stage for the discussion. Well, I want to tell you that one of the first conferences that I went to on oxalate, this is a professional oxalate conference. Um, there was a lecture where um, the scientists said that um, oxalate binds injured tissue. And he was very specific about the mechanisms because when a cell is injured, and this is any cell in your whole body, what it does is there's a cell membrane that has two layers and there's certain things that are on the underside and there's certain things that are on the overside and that's how it is normally but when it's injured there's something called a flippase that flips the things that are on the bottom side to the top side and then that tells the rest of the world the rest of your body that there is an injury there maybe this is a setup for uh you know cell death, cell suicide, things like that. And so there really are mechanisms that explain why this is kind of a universal uh, feature. And the commonality is the injury. And it may not only be an external injury, like your foot was an external injury. Oh my gosh, you know, when you fell, you knew what had happened. But then we also have internal injuries that happen because of biochemical things that may be quite unique to us. But this is why oxalate does not always look the same. And, and that's why we can't so narrowly define, oh, well, this is oxalate and this is not, because it's just not that easy. Absolutely. I see Monique saying, 
Yes, yes, yes. Would you like to add something there? <laughs> well, I'd just like to say that from my standpoint, um, I sort of rediscovered certain things that had happened to me where Oxlate um, ended up causing me some problems. Um, I'd had a couple of really bad falls where I'd injured my tailbone. And <laughs> I do remember at one point in my Oxlate dumping journey, suddenly like getting out of bed one morning and going, oh my gosh. And like, you've not, you've not fallen in your sleep in your bed overnight. Right. But I had pain like I'd had when I'd had the really bad fall. And, um, you know, the only thing that explained it was this issue of oxalate, you know, becoming tied up with that, that injured tissue as it, as it healed. Um, and I also remember, um, I'd had plantar fasciitis one time when I was in my twenties. And that was another thing that reemerged when I had, um, oxalate dumping at one point. And again, it was one of those things where I woke up in the morning with it. And so I think, you know, there is an explanation for why oxalate could be doing these various things in our bodies. And I'm so glad Susan, um, you know, weighed in and, 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 and put that out there because honestly, I, I have, I have talked with people who are like, well, oxalate can't be doing everything. You know, that's just paranoid. <laughs> and um, jokingly, I keep saying I'm going to have t-shirts made that say, when in doubt, blame oxalate. But it's kind of like that because of this, this piece where it's not always the same. It's not like um, you fall and you break your leg and the only thing that's affected is your leg. It's not like it's necessarily all the rest of you, but because of oxalate being able to act on us both biochemically and physically because of crystals forming, it's just such a, such a different ball game. And I'm so glad I'm just going to pop in because uh, Kelly just said, a, sent a beautiful message on the chat. She said, Knowing this feature of oxalate dumping early on in my journey has been helpful beyond words. Otherwise, I would have had thought so many things were wrong with me that they were very fleeting, sometimes just lasting a day. So, so much peace of mind saved. Exactly. So I think that's a little bit the idea of these conversations so that, you know, you start to understand the process and start understanding what is happening in your body. And I think this, um, this way of explaining what's happening gives you also um, a justification reason and emotionally is very soothing because it's not in your head. You are feeling pain and discomfort and, you know, and it's itching and it's burning and it's doing this and it's doing and it's moving. <laughs> You're not going crazy. It's real. And there is a mechanism that explains it. Well, I want to point out that, you know, we have uh, a medical field that is driven by the diagnosis. So they want to say, oh, well, you have a hip thing or you have a lung thing or you have a, you know, name, name your organ. Um, and, and then they think that the diagnosis takes you to the treatment because it really, it, you know, it's kind of like if you take your car into a, a repair shop and you go and they go, um, well, we have a we have a sale going on on on, uh, on radiators. I mean, you don't want them to sell you a radiator because they have a sale going on on radiators. You want somebody to get under the hood and try to figure out what's broken in your particular thing. And so um, this is why. Um, um, it, it kind of depends on where there was an injury. Of course, you know, when you go to the mechanic, you're wanting him to find the injury. Where is the hole in a, in a tube or something? And so to the same extent, uh, it becomes more of a scientific issue than it does a medical issue because what we are doing is actually finding out that there are uh, 
issue, specific issues that can be studied scientifically that are specific to your injury. Like it depends on what happened in your car, not somebody else's car. And, and so this is why it's sort of a different way to look at all of this. And, and don't, don't be scared because of that difference, because it really is just a difference in, you know, uh, approaches and, um, and looking more at uh, really something that gets back to basic biochemistry. And we need more uh, input from people about what happened because the only way we are gonna get the scientific world interested enough to, to risk their careers on pursuing something is if we just have very compelling stories. And that's why um, I was thinking about that before we started today. And I thought, you know, this is a time for us wizards probably to sit down and sit back and then hear the story. Because what ha what's important is what happened when and in what order it happened in your life and how you can put those pieces together to kind of figure out what happened. And um, that is where we're gonna really, as a group, as a, you know, a think tank, we're, a, we're like a think tank, how about that? Um, put all these pieces together because it, it takes, you know, uh, it takes a village, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Carla? No, I thought you were moving. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you were moving. And I, I also wanted to, um, to bring out another piece in this puzzle that I think would be very interesting and be very helpful for everybody to understand and also to help us with this idea of a group where everybody kind of like joins in and does different things and whatever. And it is a fact that when we don't feel well, we are more sensitive and we have different things going on and our objectivity, our capacity to respond in a very tranquil, calm, peaceful way gets extremely affected. <laughs> so it's, um, it's something that is maybe not understood by many people that just uh, that we have electricity going through our body, but we also have chemistry going through our body. And, uh, and that chemistry is going to be affecting a lot of things and might be doing some things that we are not, maybe to put it in another way, aware mentally. And it's just our chemistry that is moving along and it's causing changes. Uh, my husband knows when I'm dumping. And he's like, oh, my God, do you want me to pour you an Epsom salts bath now? <laughs> Get in the bath, you know, and um, my kids know it. They start to recognize it in themselves. But not only that, I will just tell you a very cute little story, which wasn't cute at the time at all. My father uh, passed away when he was 91. He retired at 90. And uh, he drove every day of his career to about an hour and a half in traffic to get to his office. And, uh, and it was incredible that once he retired after his 90th birthday, he would be in a criminally angry mood between 7.30 and 9. It was you could count on it for months. And he was just looking for a reason to hold on to, to justify that stress and anger chemistry that his body had gotten used to. So uh, when we're talking about changing our body's chemistry and we're doing all these things, we have to be aware that that's also going to affect, you know, how we're reacting to the world at large. 
And I'm seeing a lot of that in the group where sometimes somebody answers in a for them objective way. And then the reaction is, what do you mean? What is this? What are you? Know, there's all this anger and then there's all these coming back and forth and it becomes this cascade of very emotional people trying to express themselves. So I think it's important to know that we've been talking since the beginning of these discussions that um, we want to keep balance. Health is balance and homeostasis is when everything is working the way it should be, you know, like a nicely organized orchestra. But when we're moving that balance, we don't want to move it in a way that we're off and that we change all of that and create excess inflammation, excess um, irritation, excess everything. So that, uh, because that's going to have consequences that are not necessarily only dumping in the pure sense of seeing something in a toilet. And, and well, but let's also be clear that it's what we're talking about here too, is that some of us may be irritable, may have mood dysregulation. We talk about this on the group and that it's physiological to some degree is oxalates driving all kinds of inflammation in your body and your nervous system is coping with that as best it can. Um, but my understanding is that one of the things we do when there's a lot of inflammation present, you know, the immune system will report that to the nervous system and the nervous system kind of says, okay, I'll do what I can do, which is, you know, depress serotonin, depress dopamine and do things so that you would rest because in the grand scheme of things, ideally your inflammation or your injury is I fell down, I have a bug. But oxalates, neither of those things. It's this chronic thing, which is driving inflammation in this really chronic manner. And, and so particularly when oxalates moving, but also because we may have this chronic inflammation going on, our mood may not be as resilient. We may not be stress resilient. We may be more irritable, our energy levels can be low. And so that can drive irritability as well. And so if I can add a little bit to Patricia's story, I mean, if you were, talk, were to talk to my two, you know, children, one who's 21 now, so a young adult, and one who's 16, um, particularly the 21 year old could tell you that I am now the equivalent of Valium mom. And that when he was young, he dealt with somebody who was kind of unpredictable and irritable and eat more easily to get upset and angry. And part of that was, you know, feeling a, like I didn't have enough energy. So I was trying to protect those energy resources as carefully as possible, but also this mood dysregulation that seems to go along with oxalate because we've got this chronic inflammation going on and because that can be affecting us in all kinds of ways. And so um, we also want to, or certainly I want to encourage everyone to like take a step back and if someone seems to be irritated on the group or you're feeling irritated by a post that we just give everybody the benefit of the doubt, they're not deliberately coming after you. You're probably not deliberately going after them, but everybody might be a little more sensitive because of what's going on physiologically. Nobody's Nobody want, I don't, I don't want anybody to feel blamed or like there's something wrong with your personality. Oh my gosh. I thought I was just an irritable kind of angry woman, but it turns out that's not the truth. So what we really need to, to foster a little bit for all of us is a little bit of ease up on yourself. Your, you know, you're not fatally flawed. You have a physiological thing you're dealing with. It's called Oxley. Um, but also to ease up on others because they may be way more reactive than normal because they're just dealing with this thing going on. And, and on top of that, it may not have been validated by doctors or other healthcare professionals. Like the number of people who have told me 
my doctor said this is all in my head, either on the group or in other locations. It's, and it's not. There is a physiological thing going on here. I watched physiological symptoms get better as I did the diet, but I watched my mental and emotional game get better too. Everything was happening. But if I was, I was in the middle of oxalate dumping, I could be touchy for a while again. I could start to have difficulties setting myself back from something that somebody said to me and not taking it personally. So we, you know, we want to talk a little bit um, today, if, uh, depending on our time, about what kinds of things can help in terms of <clears throat> also giving you, you know, some tips on how to manage your stress. Um, Cause it's oxalate dumping is not just your physiological process. It's also what else is going on while you're dealing with it. Um, and we've had two years of lots of stress with bad news and COVID and restrictions and all the kinds of impacts those would have on us as well. So we're kind of layered up at this moment in time. And, and so I think, you know, we've been thinking about how we can talk a little bit about what kinds of things work while you're dumping, but also how we can you know, help support each other in this process. I'd like to throw out one little quickie thing is, um, you know, we're a whole creature. We have all kinds of systems going on. And, uh, it, you know, the expression, oh, I feel it in my gut. You know what I'm talking about like that? That is really has a lot to do with physiology because we know now that most of the serotonin, which is a real mood thing, um, is made in the gut. And then it's distributed through the body actually in platelets. Uh, can you believe that? And then, um, you know, that all affects a lot of things, you know, the, how, how our gut functions and it affects our mood and all sorts of things. And so this is why uh, it even includes the microbes that are in our gut. So it's very complex. So, you know, we like to simplify things a lot, but the really the system that puts all this together is not all that simple. And uh, so don't, don't think that there's going to be like a, you know, a one organ answer <laughs> for something because it's really a holistic thing. And, um, I think these ladies are just so wonderful in how they uh, can put it together as a more holistic thing because it really is. We're whole creatures, and you know we have got to deal with our families and how our moods affect other people and things like that. And so, um, uh, thank you so much for those stories, ladies. One of the things that I would add you know, that I saw with, with my own son is that dumping for him was much more emotional than, than physical. Whereas I was different, you know, I had knee pain, leg pain from where I broke, a broke my leg and, you know, right in the spots where I had broken it, that was where I felt the pain. You know, I had back pain, with Ian, it was completely different. He really didn't have a lot of physical pain, but emotionally, boy, that kid was all over the map. You know, he was very volatile, you know, more prone to, to meltdowns, you know, more easily irritated, more binary in, in his thinking. You know, all the, the rigidity of his thinking got you know, got worse. So, but he didn't really have any of the, any of the physical pains other than, you know, he would get that, the dumping rash, but that really didn't bother him. But he was, you know, emotionally just all over the place. And, you know, you knew it, as soon as something would, that would normally not set him off, suddenly set him off. Yep. He's dumping. And, and that would last for a couple of days. And, you know, we would have to, to kind of readjust the supplements and give him a little quiet space to, you know, for him to, to kind of back himself off the ledge and, 
a couple days later, everything would would be good. But for him, it, like I said, it was much more emotional than than physical. Yeah, my daughter was exactly the same. If all of a sudden out of the blue, she was melting down and I, there wasn't an obvious trigger, like she'd had a fight with a little friend or she'd fallen or, you know, something that was really clearly causing the problem. Then my first response was Epsom salts bath, spend some time with her, like just help her to kind of settle down again, because she would, it was very emotional for her. She would get anxious. She would get irritable. She would, um, she would react really poorly to um, any kind of stressor. And so, um, you know, to some degree, it was great for me to see that because I, it, it almost helped me realize more what was happening to me, like how easily I could be set off. And I was one of those people, just to add a little story in here, is that as time went on, I was one of those people who got like a dumping trigger just before my period. I started to wonder about the bad reputation that PMS has. <laughs> anyway, so, and I would get some really clear physiological symptoms. And, you know, I started to wonder about my husband's comments about, you know, how he could tell that my period is coming on. So I was like, is he seeing the emotional, you know, mood piece of it and I'm not really catching it so um yeah he's another one who can vouch for having a much a much happier more even less likely to take things personally wife as well <laughs> well I, I used to call some of my ab abdominal and my and my lower back pain as PMS on steroids and that was you know the first couple of months you know, when I was dumping and, and I remember at, at one point, you know, the husband was like, I feel like beating you with the broom that you flew in on. <laughs> you know, so I'm like, oh, okay. I guess that tells me how bad, you know, how, how bad I was getting. I don't get that anymore, but it was, you know, like the, the first six months. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm guessing I was pretty much hell on wheels. What's his name? Padre Pio. I think I was a bit of, um, you know, hell on wheels too. It was not exactly, um, you know, obvious to me in the way it was obvious to the people around me. So being able to see my daughter and see how clearly she's oxalate dumping, she's not, she's oxalate dumping, she's not. And um, was also really helpful to see how clearly certain really simple basics helped extra minerals, a multivitamin, uh, Epsom salts bath, you know, like now that's, it's not one size fits all. Like anybody in the wizards here can tell you it's not one size fits all, but, um, for people for whom those basics really, um, support their system, you know, again, we always say this, but start slowly, use small doses, work your way up. But, um, you know, I really want to encourage anybody who hasn't started to build a toolkit. The toolkit will help your state of mind too. And we do want to talk a little bit about other kinds of toolkit pieces that are going to, going to help with your state of mind and, um, you know, make a difference when it comes to how you're experiencing your life while you're going through these things. I think it's so interesting that I'll give you to you in, this, in a second, Susan. I think it's so interesting that it's so easy to see somebody else dumping. It's not easy to see yourself dumping. So um, just take it from us. <laughs> We've been there. And uh, start working on that toolkit. So, yes, Susan, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that um, as the senior member of the Wizards, um, I have, you know, not only am I older, but also all my friends are older. And so I'm, I'm you know, noticing all the things that, you know, all my Facebook friends are going through and things like that. And it really may be that um, when you are older, you have had more time to accumulate injuries all over the place. So it may be the reason why 
as we get older, our, our issues are more obviously like, oh my hip, oh my this, you know, more uh, related to things that happen to us and we can even remember what they were some of the time, maybe not all the time, the time. But yet there are also things that happen in each decade. There are things that happen to teenagers. There are things that happen to young adults. There are people who, you know, that happen to women during their periods. And, you know, so there, there are different life events that tend to focus in, in certain areas. And that would be a fascinating thing actually for us to look at you know, as a group to see if we, we have, you know, a set of, uh, of warnings and this is how I coped um, instructions for people for each decade of life and male versus female too. Yeah. So I'm just throwing that out. So we were talking about some of the things that happen on your physiology when you're stressed. And when you're stressed, you have, of course, you have adrenaline and you have epinephrine, you have all these chemicals starting to float around and being moved to every cell of your body. They're also being transported by water. So uh, your body is going to actually take water from where it can find it to start putting, because when you're going into the sympathetic state of the nervous system it's survival that's the highest priority it's not okay well we'll see what's going to happen no it's going to say we're surviving it's fight flight or immobilize i need to take whatever resources are available because this is survival time so our digestion is going to stop our um our water source is just going to even be taken even from the the cushions between our vertebrae you know Moisture is going to be taken out so these hormones can get everywhere. So some of the things that we would like to add to that kid, of course, the first ingredient is water. You need to drink and drink and drink and drink and in doubt, drink. <laughs> That's going to be like the best first aid, first response, first reaction that you should have because an oxalate dumping is a stress feature to your metabolism. And when all of the stress is happening and all these chemicals are coming to survive by, the thing is that the nervous system doesn't have a thousand different possibilities to react. Stress is stress is stress. Whether it's a phone call from school, it's a car accident, a thief or a snake on your garden or a movie, you know, and some alien or some whatever that's making you jump, your body is going to respond with the exact same chemistry, which is fight, flight or immobilize. So your first response should be water. And I was such a good stop and I just wanted somebody to jump and nobody's well, jumping. <laughs> and not just, not just water, but also electrolytes. electrolytes. Mm -hmm. Because electrolytes. you're going to be losing yeah. some of those minerals. So, so mix up the water, you know, maybe with some coconut water, you know, you know, my son loves Gatorade. We have to, to kind of ease him back off of that. So he's now doing more coconut water because you can get the same thing without all the the nasty stuff that Gatorade tends to have, but you know, balance that out too, because while you're you're losing water, you're also losing minerals. Well, and straight ahead salt. Like I can't tell you the number of times where something like a headache's been coming on and a big glass of water with salt in it has been my my savior. Now I don't mean like plain ordinary salt but like a pink salt or a sea salt where maybe you have some other minerals as well but minerals are being hugely impacted by oxalate and electrolytes are just a fancy name for certain minerals that we're talking about in the body because they they do things that other minerals don't but um you know we really we really need to think about some of those as basic stress support and of course magnesium which is considered an electrolyte is um 
you know, a really important mineral in terms of muscle relaxation and energy production in the body. Like we've got all kinds of reasons to want to make sure that our, that our electrolytes and our minerals are in pretty good shape when you're dealing with oxalate. A little bit of bicarbonate that might be bicarbonate's uh, a great idea. Like the whole Epsom salts bath we were talking about. I would, um, when I, when I would dump my, my daughter in a bath, there would be a few lavender oil <laughs> drops that would go in as well, but I would give her some of the Epsom salts and some of the bicarbonate and she would have fun turning it into paste and then doing things with it. Great to absorb more of it, but she was getting some sodium. She was getting some magnesium. She was getting some bicarbonate. She was getting some sulfate. It's just, you know, that kind of thing can't be underestimated. So, you know, you can take a little bit of baking soda, a little bit of salt, coconut water. You can make yourself like a little drink and that can be really supportive to your system. And with the bicarb, adding it to the soda, that helps with the itching. So that, that's also something to keep in mind because my son would get out of the Epsom salt baths without the baking soda like he had fleas. Yeah. And, yeah. and as soon as I added the, the bicarb, that kind of settled, you know, settled that down. So if, if you find that you're really, really itchy after an Epsom salt bath, try adding a little bit of baking soda and that might help. Yeah. And you can actually get, um, for a while, I tried to fully trick out a bath. So we would, we would use Epsom salts and then I would use regular baking soda, but I would also get potassium bicarbonate. And instead of just using baking soda, I would use half potassium bicarbonate, half baking soda. So then you're getting, you're getting potassium, sodium, magnesium. So you're getting kind of the big guys in the electrolytes. You're getting the bicarbonate, you're getting the sulfate. So there's, there are some simple things you can do here that could be really helpful from a stress management standpoint. Um, and I would mm -hmm. also suggest if you're, if you have any questions about having enough nutrients in your diet for whatever reason, you know, trying to take some of the big guys, again, start at small amounts, but I found my stress level was helped by B6, it was helped by biotin, it was helped by B1. And those three were kind of big ticket for me, but I also found if I took a little bit of B12 with some folic, you know, so sometimes nutrients can make a big difference to just help support our body as we're going through this kind of stress. Funny, yeah, Susan. before we get off of this, when you switched and added in the potassium bicarbonate, what changes did you see over when you were just using sodium bicarbonate? Um, I didn't notice a lot different for Raina, but she was little. And what I was really looking for was just that she could calm down and she could relax and she could start to think again because she would get so anxious and so like go into this meltdown where her brain was kind of offline. So I was really just looking for her brain to be able to come back online and then me, me to be able to, to help her, her to be able to tell me a little better what was going on. But for myself, um, it was really subtle, but I just felt a little more balanced. I'm going to use the word when I would get out of the tub. Um, I, I would, yeah, I would just feel more balanced when I did that combination. Now I, I haven't continued to do it because we're no longer in really heavy dumping. So now I just add baking soda if we need some. But um, you know, earlier in the process. I, I did, I did find that it just seemed to be like the bath was a little more soothing somehow. So uh, it, it wasn't, it wasn't something where I can be really definitive about what it was doing for us, but, um, but it did seem to support that basic homeostasis, that basic balance a bit better. Well, does, do any of our members have anything to say about potassium, you know, uh, adding that to a bath? Or Actually, someone in, this, in the chat has just said, oh. that's the same experience I have with adding oh, potassium correct. to the bath, soothing. So there's two of us now. <laughs> so you're saying it was soothing, Chris? 
Yes, I also follow that recipe that is Epsom salt, baking soda, potassium bicarbonate. And I, it is more soothing, but it feels like the water is softer. So maybe that's an element because I love the feel of it as well, but it just feels whole, like rounded and balanced. It's just, it's very soothing. And it doesn't take a lot. And I ordered little individual bags of the potassium bicarbonate and it's a teaspoon or, you know, of each of them. And it just really did add to the experience and I did feel calmer. Well, that's a wonderful thing to learn. Thank you. No, that's wonderful. So uh, some other things is you when you are in that state, I think the other really important thing is to listen to your body. It's not a good idea to just power through. And like Carla was saying earlier, you know, and burn the candle on both ends and just try to get as much done as you as you can when you're not feeling that well. And you have to start looking into getting more sleep. So that's another one uh, of the of the recommendations that you know we were talking about. That I think it's going to be really um, you need to put it in the place with the importance that it should have. Sleep is incredibly important for you to get back that you know that strength, get that calm, get that perspective, and, you know, and be in a better place to be um, to be able to to do whatever it is that you do every day. I would like to answer Soha's question that she just posted because she was asking about, well, what about foot soaks versus a bath, you know, that kind of thing. And um, you know, this project began as an, a, a kind of outgrowth of work that I did in graduate school well, because my father has such an incredible response to Epsom salts, but my father had broken his hip. And so he could not get in a tub. And I know that there was no way I would have gotten him to you know, sit with his feet in a bucket or something like that. That just would not have happened. And so what we did with him was we, we put um, uh, Epsom salts, about this much Epsom salts in a cup, and then would add water. And after his bath, we would have his AIDS. He, he had dementia and you know we had a lot of help for him back then, uh, but they would put that on his skin and it was incredible what it did. So I think one of the myths about these Epsom salt soaks is that it is all, you know, like all the bad guys are going into the water. Well, that totally could not have happened with the way we did it with my dad because he wasn't in water. So it wasn't floating out into the water. And so what I learned in graduate school is that the detox process actually happens in your body after the action of two different enzymes that use what you absorb from the water. <laughs> so the, it's actually the sulfate and the magnesium is getting into your body and then it's being processed by your body and used to detox things. So this is why it really doesn't matter that much how you're getting it. It's just that you're getting it. And, and then one other thing that could be very important is that, um, you know, we're used to the idea of you get all your nutrition by eating it, right? You know, <laughs> but, but this is different where you're getting your quote nutrition through your skin. And so the reason this may be important is that the, um, the lining of the gut has these things called mucins and they're very slippery and they have a lot of sulfate on them. And so magnesium sulfate may be a very, a uh, disruptive thing if you took it internally. But when you take it where it goes through your skin, then it's got your whole body processing to, to do before, um, you know, it gets in your blood and then it gets distributed to your body. So it's not uh, as, as problematic as if you swallowed it. And I don't know if anybody ever even thought about, you know, swallowing Epsom salts, but it would taste terrible. 
And and I don't think it would be a good idea anyway because of the way we are built. Does that help anybody? Yes, I think so. I, I see through your thank you. So ha, huh? thanks. That's true. So going back to the sleep, I think. Uh, Okay, Kelly's saying, when I sleep well is when my body seems to mobilize oxalate and initiate the biggest dumps, or it clears what was on the move really well, which means a new one's starting right behind it. So anytime I get a good solid night of sleep, I have to brace myself that the next day for what is to come. So again, knowing what is happening has been life-saving or I would have lost my mind by now. Absolutely, knowledge is power. When you start to understand what's happening, and you start to see, you know, what you're looking at and you know that it, you're not imagining things and it's not all in your head. And it's, you know, it's a real thing that is happening that you can control it. Then that's just, uh, just more power to you. And it allows you to keep doing it and getting rid of this toxin. I would just like to know if anybody else has noticed that like um like kelly did have you noticed that maybe i've noticed that i'm saying that i that even happened to me this week that there was there was a day i slept a lot and the next day i was horrible and uh, how many people does that happen to do we have anybody else not me me okay i got that anybody else you can wave. I think there's a way, way for you to wave with Zoom. <laughs> but you can raise your hand with Zoom. Anyone who else wants to, to say that they, they fall in there. Okay, so we've got Pammy Gale who's got her hand up. And yeah, so we've got at least others. So yes. And uh, I'm just saying, do you use potassium bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate, and calcium bicarbonate in your bath? That's a question for Monique. All of them in the same bath. Anything yeah, no. Else? Yeah, I, I, what I've really focused on is the Epsom salts because of the kind of support that Susan's talking about here with the sulfate and the magnesium. That was our first thing that we used. I didn't start out with bicarbonates. So I started out with plain Epsom salts baths. Then we went to bicarbonate. And the only place I've gone to has been uh, baking soda, inexpensive, works well. Um, and then I added the potassium. And the potassium is really because of, um, you know, some of the discussions that have been on the group about people needing more potassium and wanting to do that in as gentle a way as possible. And the whole idea of, yeah, you're, diffusing these nutrients slowly through the skin you're not like taking something orally it hits the gut the capsule dissolves and boom you've got this big bang kind of dose in there in the gut i i really liked the whole thing of getting some of this slowly diffusing in where it did seem to be gentler and it did seem to work for us but i never tried using calcium bicarbonate or any other things like that um and in terms of where I got these things, baking soda at the store um, and potassium bicarbonate, I, um, I personally buy from a website ironically called nuts.com, uh, where they sell a food grade potassium bicarbonate that you can use in baking like leavening. So, um, oh, look at there. Chris is showing us some. Do you see that? Yeah, from pure pure thank yeah. you Chris. potassium bicarbonate food great okay. great so there we've got another another place where you can buy it from so sure. it's not it's not really something where where i've gone to a particular place and go ahead chris i'm sure i just googled it and this was a brand that i may have found recommended on tlo i'm not sure but this is just what i have okay perfect it says food grade which i don't know makes it feel more pure and that's what I was after. I was after a food grade product. So I was feeling pretty comfortable with my child sitting in a bathtub with it. So, yeah. 
Now, Nikki, uh, is your hand still up because you wanted to ask something or is that still just a response to our earlier question? I, sorry, I'm trying to figure out Zoom on my phone. It's just, I don't have an additional question. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank didn't you. want to leave you out. Nope, you're good. Thank you. Okay, and I think Kelly's waving her hand. Yeah, I just, it hit me. I wanted to expand real quick on what I said about sleep uh, to bring it back into the, the topic about mood and stress and everything is that another big um, help this has all been is uh, not only in understanding some of my previous life, <laughs> but currently um, understanding that wave that happens, especially related to my female cycle or sleep, because those seem to be the two things where the largest changes happen, not something kind of a a smaller, you know, like throughout the day, you can feel your mood change or feel your physical, you know, uh, uh, how well you feel change. But anyway, those big hits where all of a sudden, you know, you kind of feel bipolar or something like it because of how quick the change is. Understanding how it works now um, has helped me stop, say, uh, stressing out relationships or when it comes to business or whatever, because now I understand those mornings where I wake up sometimes after good sleep, where you feel like you can like take over the world. And that's when you make commitments or that's when you want to start a new business venture or whatever. And by the afternoon, you can barely feed yourself. <laughs> you feel like <laughs> understanding that now has helped me manage life in a way to where I'm not, it's not this downhill, you know, where you just feel like you're messing everything up because now you understand to make no decisions or commitments when you're on that high right after you've cleared a bunch that, you know, so anyway, it's helped tremendously in life to understand that that's happening all the time so that I only make decisions when I'm in that middle part of how am I going to extend myself to others in business relationships, whatever. Um, and that has also been major in making life normal or bearable or whatever. <laughs> that's just wisdom. You are imparting wisdom to the rest of us, Kelly, and thank you. Thank y'all. Yeah. I, I wanted to throw out something because um, everybody now has heard the concept of the, uh, I, I'm sorry, the helicopter mom. And um, I, I think if we waved about how many people as, as they were trying to solve the problems of their kids with mood disorders and whatever, could have been put in that category. I know that that um, I mean, I have a daughter that did not have extreme issues in that area, but I know that um, Epsom salts was so effective that my daughter got to resenting me because I was so apt to say, you know, almost first thing, as soon as I recognized this physiological thing going on with her, that I was in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and then she got to feeling like I didn't respect her feelings. Now, and the I, same thing. My daughter now won't get in a bath. Go ahead, Susan. <laughs> okay, so I just want, you know, these are some veteran moms here who are telling you that however you manage that, be a, you know, take a little wisdom from us who maybe might have overdone it a bit that maybe you can be a little bit more subtle or also, um, you know, to allow your child to feel more like it's their, their idea, if you can get it that way. Yeah. Uh, it looks yeah. like you have some wisdom. Buy-in, buy-in, buy-in. Buy-in, yeah. And, buy -in. and that works not just with, with what you're eating, but you know, everything else is as soon as I made in an integral part of the process and I won't say necessarily put him in charge, but, you know, gave him a much better say about how he approached things. It, it really helped because now he understands what's going on with, with him and what things, you know, can, you know, can help. 
And it's like I said, it's not just, you know, it's not just diet. It's, you know, I need, I need a safe space to de-stress. I mean, we had at one point we had a freaking pup tent that the kid would go into, you know, when he needed, you know, to kind of work himself off the ledge on his own karate, you know, he knows, you know, how much that has helped him get his and, and maintain his emotional balance. He's only required to go, you know, twice a week to, you know, maintain his, his membership. But, you know, at, at one point when he had, had busted his leg, he was going, he was going three days a week. He wasn't necessarily participating when he had his, his knee issues, but, you know, he wasn't doing the physical part participation, but he was helping other students. He was, you know, doing leadership stuff. So, and, and, and that, that helps. So the more, the more buy-in that you can give your kids and the more you, you help them to recognize and then come up with their own strategies, you know, the easier it is. Stress well, management, you can't underestimate this. And I did have various points in time where I was so stressed. I, I almost needed something to do it for me. And that shouldn't be something that we feel bad about either. But, you know, like Carla's saying, exercise, going for a walk, like gentle stuff. But I also have now um, trialed a number of different devices to help you move from the sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your, and kind of focused on the vagus nerve, which is rest, digest, repair. And um, some of those things have been great because there were times when I had so little energy, I just wanted something to do it to me. <laughs> So, you know, in those moments, Epsom salts baths were always helpful for me as well in terms of de-stressing, but I have, I have also worked with other kinds of tools where it either helps you to meditate or helps you to, um, you know, get the vagus nerve doing some of its own work again. Um, there's exercises like yoga that can help you with that vagus nerve piece, um, but we really can't underestimate um, how much stress we're really under with just all the things going on in life and then whatever oxalate's doing to us at the same time. Exactly. And I think we're going to be closing down on that thought. So just please remember to be gentle to yourself, be gentle to those around you that are going on the same journey, you know, like our kids. Uh, do the buy-in and be gentle also to the people around you. Just, you know, just be very, very conscientious of the fact that we've gone through two years worth of fear fed to us every single day while we're going through a metabolic stress on this oxidative journey. And uh, everybody on the list is going through the same thing. So yeah, be I guess to your fellow group members be kind, all so stressed. <laughs> be kind, be gentle, be gentle to yourself as well. And don't put yourself ever in the last place. You are important. And uh, one of the things I wrote a book in Spanish that's called Who Cares for the Caregiver? It's, it's in Spanish. I will translate it. But anyway. Uh, one of the things I say is that, you know, kids don't expect pa perfect parents. They expect happy parents, calm parents. So um, let's work on ourselves. Let's realize what we're all going through. And let's make this really a call for a better world. Can you imagine how many people are very, very angry because they just had a spinach smoothie with soy uh, milk and some salads and things and had some, you know, 
all those they things that we know about gluten-free baked products made with almond flour like there's so many things out there that people could be doing accidentally where they're actually upping their oxalate and then they're dealing with the downside of that so be gentle that's going to be the message for this week and uh it is 17 17- zero zero here in brussels we're going to call it a day we'll see you next week wizards thank you so much for joining us we will be posting this recording in the youtube group and um all the questions that we've been receiving on the low oxalate uh low ox project at gmail.com group uh we are thinking there's some that are really should be part of like a basic answer or frequently answered questions type of deal. So we're looking into having more like a Google doc that we're gonna post. And it's gonna be kind of like moving constantly there. And we'll just let you know when your answer has been answered. I think that's gonna make a lot more sense Then everybody's gonna have a place to go and even do the find function to, you know, find different themes and topics and whatever. And we'll just keep posting. We're trying to make this as efficient and as loving and as gentle for everybody as possible so just be patient with us we're we're learning (laughs) we're learning also all the ups and downs with google in three different countries but um, i hope you have a wonderful week thank you monique thank you susan thank you carla and thank you all of you that joined us live (laughs) <laughs> and uh, thank you for all of your inputs and your comments and whatever. And let's see you next week. <laughs>